Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to feast upon your word. We know that time is short, and we know that we are to redeem the time because the days are evil. There's nothing better than that we could do than spend time in your word. I ask that you would help us, dear Lord, to see you in these scriptures as we come together to talk about it. We know that no man has a handle on the truth. I ask you, dear Father, to filter out all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Just a couple of announcements here before we begin. I invite you to, uh, to look at BlessedHopeForever.com uh, to take a vi time to visit uh, our home page and where that you can easily access the playlists of all the studies that we've done. I also invite you all to join us as we uh, uh, run out the time here, which I believe is short, to join us on Facebook. We, we've uh, transitioned uh, to a Facebook group uh, where that we fellowship together, exalting Christ, not self, uh, grace, not law. So we welcome your fellowship. And I want to say something about those who have uh, taken the time to uh, leave us encouraging comments here on uh, these videos. Uh, we don't, I don't consider that, uh, I don't take that lightly. Uh, I try to read every one that, that, that uh, comments uh, I may not have time to comment back, but I just want you to know just how much we appreciate you. In our st studies together, we've been studying the book of Revelation verse by verse, and we've come to uh, the church, uh, the letter to the church at Philadelphia. That's, uh, that's not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which which I thought, like I thought it was when I was somewhere around the age of seven. I want to say something before I begin about these seven letters. This may be a little bit difficult for me to formulate into words, but what I find striking and, and perhaps maybe I shouldn't use that word. What I find interesting, which we shouldn't find, we should not find surprising, is that the, the doctrin, doctrinal truth, the, the biblical truth, uh, I'm talking about that which particularly pertains to our walk, our relationship with Christ, comes forth in these letters uh, it's it's just difficult to even look at these letters without giving heed to doctrine and and what what we shouldn't find surprising is is that it doesn't in any way contradict the teaching the the biblical the sound biblical doctrine the teaching that we see in the Pauline epistles Paul's letters, uh, 13 epistles. That, sh that shouldn't surprise us any because the, it's the same, the same author, the same person who spoke to Paul, spoke to John. And I, I think that's important to take note of that as we go through these letters because it helps us to understand these letters. In, uh, I believe in my last video, 
I tried to point out the the need for for us to have a solid understanding of of what it means to overcome uh, what it means to not be written out out of the book of life uh, the definition of the second death what the second death is what that means and how that relates to those who are uh, under what we would commonly refer to as the age of accountability of which there is no listed age in scripture there is a, a sequence of events that occurred, which if we take and tie those together, we are forced to come to the conclusion that all children go to heaven. But it's not just about all children going to heaven. It's important that we realize that the the dynamic of how, how dynamic the fact is is that no man will stand before God being judged for Adam's transgression because it was removed in Christ. In 1 John 2.2, 2, we read that Christ is the propitiation for our sins and not, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. God was fully satisfied with the sacrifice of his son were that every single sin that that everyone had ever committed from beginning to to end past present future every single sin was atoned for it had to be that way there could not be one sin that christ did not pay for Otherwise, his work was insufficient. And so, that brings us to Romans 7, 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, says Paul. So, we died in our own sins. Now, when that occurs is only God knows. But there comes a time where the, the law comes in, sin revives, and we die. And then born again. We need to be born again. And, and of course, you, if you follow this channel, you, you know our position on the new birth. That we're born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. All of those who are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world will come to Him. My sheep hear my voice. And so we're born again. And, and being born again, we become an overcomer. That word is a word that we read repeatedly in these letters. That's how we become an overcomer. We don't over overcome in our own strength. And that's how we escape the second death, which we're going to see in this book of Revelation. That's why our name is not blotted out of the book of life, which into which I believe it was written when Christ died for the sins of the whole world. So there's the sequence. I believe it's biblical. I believe that it's supported by a great number of scriptures. And I also believe that it's validated by uh, the, uh, in, a, in a great number of ways. There are many others, other respectable, notable, uh, uh, worthy scholars of the past, as well as the present who also hold to that position. No child is going to burn forever in the lake of fire. Now, of course, that has, that has enormous ramifications when it comes to the rapture of the church, which I've talked about in, in other videos, which I don't have time to get into here. Uh, there are many positions many positions on biblical eschatology, prophecy, the book of Revelation. There are about as many viewpoints or positions as Carter has pills. I'd like to think that I teach truth. I honestly, folks, 
would rather die than teach error. So I'm going to give you my opinion. I've, I've been doing that, and I don't ask anyone to agree with me. I'm just going to tell you what I think these verses mean, and that's all that I can do. So, in looking at Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy. And the first thing I did was I stopped at the word holy. In order to try to understand or the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey through our Lord's own words here, I think is, is extremely important. I, I want to understand the mind of the Lord. I want to understand the heart of the Lord. These things saith he that is holy. Why did he say that? Because we're looking at the deity of Christ. I am Jehovah. We read in Isaiah, He is sovereign. He is supremely sovereign over all of creation. Not just all of creation, but our lives. He directs our steps. He knows the path that we take. He's laid out our path. It's not a matter of fatalism as, as many would, would think. I've actually, in talking about the sovereignty of God, I've actually had sincere Christians ask me, well, well Steve, doesn't that sound a little bit like fatalist, uh, fatalistic sort of a, a, a viewpoint of God? If He's determined our steps, then why should we worry about anything? We, we are told to work out our salvation. This is not redemption. This is salvation, deliverance. Only redeemed people are saved. We're to work out our salvation with fear, that is respect and trembling, because it is God at work in us, both the will and do of His good pleasure. Folks, you belong to Him. He can, he can do anything with you that He wants. And I think we're, we're sort of short-circuiting that whole idea by, by just stopping there. It, it is, it's not just that He can do anything with you that He wants. He does do with you as He wants. We're talking about the God of the universe who created all things, who spoke the worlds into existence, who hung the stars in the heavens, our Lord who, who died in our place, the one who's coming again to receive us unto Himself, that, that where He is we may be also, who's coming to rule and reign. And it's only fitting, I believe, that He would, he would say, that He is holy. He's saying, I am God of very God, and I am sovereign. I, uh, only a sinless God could take and remove our transgressions. He that is true, we know that He's true, that God doesn't lie. He can be trusted. He that is true, the church there at Philadelphia needed to understand that God was not Jesus was not only God, and He was not only sovereign over over their lives, but that He could be trusted. And He has the key of David, and we're going to talk a bit, just a bit about that. Now, when I looked at this, I, you know, it, it wasn't difficult to see that the key of David is a term found in Isaiah as well as here. In Revelation and a key indicates control or authority 
or access if you wanted to look at it that way. Therefore, having the key of David would give him control of David's. It's the key of David. Therefore, in, it's not just a key. It's the key of David. That would give him control of David's domain. Now, what was David's domain? Well, Jerusalem, the city of David, and the kingdom of Israel. The fact that, that here in this verse he holds this key shows that he is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the ruler of the new Jerusalem, the Lord of the kingdom of heaven, that he's coming to, to rule and reign. And, I've, and I've, I've expressed my belief that these churches, these letters to these seven churches, primarily reflect the condition of the church just prior to Daniel's 70th week. Not that it doesn't have application to the church all the way back to the beginning. And that these, because these letters were shared, whatever truth, whatever the Lord had to say to one church, even though it was a, they, they were individual letters to seven churches, there remains an application for each church. What was true of what he said to one church is true of all the rest of the churches. That's, that's one reason why, uh, you know, when we get to the church at Laodicea, and, you know, we, uh, I, I don't know how to put this except to say that it, we're, we're tempted to look at some of the things that are said in particular to each church and say, well, that doesn't apply to one of the other churches. And I don't, I don't believe that that is true. There will always be wheat and tear. There will always be truth and error. I believe that the one thing that all seven churches shared in common, besides their love for the Lord, was the problems that existed. You're going to find that in all the churches. You're not going to, you know, it, it would be wrong, in my opinion, to look at one church as, well, they don't have the problems that this other church has. That's not what I'm seeing in the text. So he's the ruler of the New Jerusalem, the, the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. He's coming back to rule and reign. The Old Testament references is Isaiah 22, 22. Easy to remember. Isaiah 22, 22. It's there that the prophet tells uh, the palace secretary that he'll be replaced by, by someone else at, because God will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. The one who holds the keys has the authority. So, therefore, the key of David implies control of David's domain, which was promised to the Messiah in both Old and New Testaments. We know that from, from Isaiah. We know that from Luke, if you wanted to read the first chapter of Luke. He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and no man openeth. He that opens, and no man shuts, and shuts, and no man opens. Now, uh, if you want to really look at that cross-reference, that opening and shutting, you know, you can go to the 11th chapter of Luke, and you can see where Jesus said, said, Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. Well, how did they do that? By making it of works, of law. Well, you're not good enough to enter. In Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, he says. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter. Nor will you let in those who wish to enter. 
Okay? He that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. Verse 8, I know thy works. Works. Plural. He knows our works. We're not judged by our works. Okay? It's important to take note. It's that of the, the singular and the plural here. If, in fact, if you do a study on the word work and you look at, at the singular versus the plural, you'll, you'll see uh, what I'm talking about here. It's not works plural, which is uh, uh, works plural for the believer has no relationship to Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. None. It is work singular. If you look at the, the believer, uh, his life, his entire life's work singular, the work is looked at as a whole. It's how we built on Christ. Okay? That's what we're judging. You know, I think many Christians have the wrong idea about Bama. They think that, you know, we're going to all stand around and we're going to watch a, a some really rotten, you know, some movie of our past life where, the, you know, we see every rotten thing that we ever did. And, and you know, and, and I guess most everybody else will see that too. And, you know... Uh, you know, what a horrible, horrible concept or idea that that is. That is not what is going to happen at Bama. We're not, you're, the Lord is not going to rerun, play some rerun of some uh, rotten, filthy preview or uh, re, uh, you know, of, uh, past uh, preview of, of your uh, sinful life. That's not, that's not the case. Now, it is the case when it comes to uh, the, the great white throne judgment. The non-believer is judged for his works, plural. Okay? And we have the, our Lord telling the angel here, I know thy works. So he knows his works. Okay? But he's not judged according to his works as the non-believer is. The non-believer is judged according to his works, plural. Behold, I have, I have. Underline the words, I have, I have. That is, no one else did, not even you did. I have set before thee an open door. Okay? All right? Uh, we don't open those doors. Uh Mainly that, that is a phrase that, it has, that pertains to ministry. I believe it's a little more than that. But he says, I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it. No man can shut it. Well, it's interesting how that, you know, uh, I've actually heard Christians say to me in the past that, you know, the Lord opened the door and then he shut it. You know, he just closed it. You know. And here we have a verse that says, that he doesn't do that. An open door. I believe that uh, it's particularly in relationship to ministry. We read in in First Corinthians chapter sixteen uh, that uh, Paul says a, a wide door for effective service is open to me. Okay, and there are, there are many adversaries. Uh, if you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you see that open door uh, mentioned in relationship to the gospel of Christ. Okay? But I think that it's more than that. I think that even though in every reference that you look at, it's, it pertains to the ministry, to the word, to the gospel, I believe the open door is saying also that God has ordained our steps. He's ordained our life. He's, he's paved the way ahead of us. He's opened doors that no man can shut. And, and how, does he do, how has He done that? Well, what is it that can't be shut? What is it that, why is it that, that it can't be shut? No man, it says, can shut it. 
the, the only possible interpretation, folks, that you could that you could take from that is that man by through in his own will and his own strength through his own volition has no ability whatsoever to shut the doors that God has opened and that in particular particularly as it as it, it relates to uh, our steps that God has ordered that he's directed and and most especially in relationship to effective service as it regards uh, the gospel and the teaching of the word. I believe that's what we're looking at there. That God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. Uh, if you go over to Acts, chapter 14, when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how He had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Okay? Folks, God's will will be accomplished on heaven and on earth. I it amazes me the number of Christians that think that they can somehow usurp God's authority, circumvent God's will, uh, that somehow that the, the will of the creature can override the will of, of the Creator. I mean, the, the idea, folks, I'm sorry, but the idea to me is just absurd. For thou hast a little strength. And the word little there is the word micro in the Greek. It's, 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 it's hardly any. It's, it's nothing compared to God's strength. Uh, this messenger that he's writing to, and this is all in the singular. Obviously, he wasn't wholly dead, as was the, the messenger that we looked at at, at Sardis. And as long as that was the case, the door was still open for him to preach the word. But look at what you've done. You, you've, you've got the strength, you know, the, the size of a mustard seed here. You, you've got little strength, hardly any strength at all. But look at what you've done. You've kept my word. The word kept is tereo, it's guard. It means you've guarded. Doesn't mean you've done the you've done the law. Doesn't mean that you keep the law, you've kept the law. We're not looking at law here. It's guarding his word. Thou hast kept my word, and you haven't denied my name. Well, I'm of the personal opinion, folks, that that doesn't require a whole lot of strength. Now, and I'm sure that many there are many of you out there who would agree with me that it doesn't take a whole lot of effort it seemingly on your part and on the, on the part of others that you know who hold so tenaciously to these truths of grace. It doesn't really re require a whole lot of strength to just guard His Word and not deny His name. Not much at all. It, it seems to just come easy. In fact, it almost comes as natural as breathing, is what I would say. Doesn't require much strength. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue, that's not church, of first clue that we're looking at something Jewish, even though the early Christians first met in synagogues. He could have, the Lord could have said church. He didn't say, He said synagogue. Of Satan which say that they are Jews okay now we're looking at a church context here I'm, I'm sure there's not a whole lot of Christians in churches today running around calling themselves Jews now without getting into the whole argument you know why has the church become Israel the replacement theology which is not biblical Behold, I will, and it's a future tense. I will make them, that's plural, all 
Okay, not only is it future tense, it's all plural. I will make them all. Okay, all. Come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. I don't see how we can look at that as anything other than the, the fact that every knee shall bow. But they're going to worship God. Not the Philadelphians. They're going to worship God before their feet and to know that I have loved thee. Okay, well, I had to stop and think, okay, are, are, you know, is this the great white throne judgment where every knee shall bow? Because we're not going to be present. So how can they come and worship before their feet? So that, that doesn't seem to fit very well. And, and when you go through all of the, the possibilities here, it's, it, it seems a little difficult to, to try to pinpoint a place, a, a location. Uh, uh, we know it's future tense, a location of, of when this is going to occur. But uh, I have some thoughts on that. Uh, we know that every knee shall bow. But we also, if, if you're familiar with the, the great white throne judgment, we are not present at the great white throne judgment. Is the great white throne judgment the place in which every knee shall bow? Well, perhaps it is. But we're not present. Okay. I will make thee to come and worship before thy feet. The future tense doesn't necessarily have to mean that far into the future, okay? But I will at some point, perhaps in the near future, cause them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee, okay? I'm looking at grace here. I'm looking that they, they, are, they are not... The text, folks, you cannot argue with the fact that the text clearly says, okay, they say they are Jews, okay, but they're not. Okay, now, it, so it's tempting to, to take and, and say, okay, the, these are God's people. These are not God's people. They're saying that they're God's people, but they're not. There's, there's, we know that there's tear among the wheat, but we also know that, that, that there, there are wheat, there is wheat, okay, who is legalistic, that, that there, is, there is, trust me, there, are, there is legalistic wheat among you. There's, there are legalistic tares among you, okay? But there are also legalistic wheat among you. Many, many Christians believe that we're under law, not grace. They, they are legal, legal uh, Judaizers, legalizers. They, are, they believe that we stand before God, our standing before God rises or falls based on human performance. You know, that, that's what they believe. And they are truly God's people. Okay? Let's read it again. I will make I will, not you, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews. That's, that's a whole different, you know, it's the, the, it seems to me the mind of the Holy Spirit is going, uh, is leaning toward those who, who are there that are, they're just, I don't know how to, to say it except to just to simply say that that they are, are, they are, just modern day Pharisees, okay? But, but, he says in the future, I will make them to come and to worship. Worship. Now, I understand that in, in the end, every knee shall bow. The non-believers that face the great, great white throne judgment, that, that it, every knee shall bow. But, but he says, worship. And worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. Okay? 
And look what he says in verse 10. Because, now we have a, a henna clause, what they call it. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Okay? My patience. Not your patience. My patience. That phrase, my patience, where that, that, and it's a genitive there. It belongs to Christ. It's His patience. That infers perseverance, okay? Preservation. I mean, we're looking at His patience. That's, that's the endurance of, of such a kind, of such a sort, that ensures the same persistence that He had in spite of all the opposition and sufferings which came in His way. Okay? All right? This is what we face as believers in Christ who live under grace, not law. We face opposition. We face sufferings which come our way. And as a result, it strengthens our faith. We become... We endure that. It, it ensures the same persistence that He had in spite of all. All of that that came against him. They have guarded both his word and his patience. And, and I believe that's the only way that, that those that would oppose us would ever come to have a knowledge. I'm talking about an experiential knowledge of the truth. I, I'm seeing them as God's people. Folks, now you may have a different view, but that's how I'm, that's how I'm seeing this. And then we get into I also will keep thee from the hour of testing, and so we'll talk a bit about that. Now, folks, I can. Uh, there's been a lot said about the word ek in the Greek there, out of. I will keep thee out of the hour of temptation or testing. The word means testing, and I I believe that I can prove it. It the to be away from, uh, the word ek can also mean away from, uh, uh, but to, to be strictly uh, contextual uh, or textual, I can, I can prove that it, it's oppo in the majority of the manuscripts, which means away from, I'll keep you away from the hour, that's the very hour of it. So they can't be in it, which which would make it you know uh, to not act out of to keep you out of as if you know, to imply that you're in it, but I'm going to take you out of it or something. And and I don't believe that that's referring to AD seventy. Uh, it wasn't referring to the present time. It's referring to a future time which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And the word there, dwell, is that's those who have made this earth their permanent abode. Okay? So we're not, we're not looking at, uh, it's not, not Hitler, not the reign of the Maccabees. Uh, this is not for the church. The uh, First Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, we wait for His Son from heaven, in whom we wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivered us from, already done, the wrath to come. I'd like for you to just forget labels. I mean, there's a lot of arguments, especially on YouTube these days, about, you know, is it pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, partial-trib, you know, three quarters trip. You know, you know, people tend to even make up new new labels. Uh, just forget the labels, okay? Just forget it, and just look at the text. I've expressed my my opinion on how I believe that that. Uh, well, it's folks. It's just I just take this literal. I I would hope that I would stand before God someday and say, well, and if I was wrong, at least I can say, Lord, I just took. I took your word literally. I took it uh, at face value, just for what you said. It is not complicated to see in this verse, which is a, 
which is a famous verse for pre-tribbers, I know, that uh, we are just not destined to be in side Daniel's 70th week. I've done a, 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 at least a few videos on this. Uh, refer you back to those. You can watch those on pre-trib. How that when you go through all of the all of the positions, you look at them from a, a scriptural standpoint, uh, and you, you just by mere process of elimination, there's only one that will stand the test of scripture, and that is a pre-trib rapture. And again, I believe that we're looking at the condition of the church prior to his return in these letters. They are not only delivered from the, the, the temptation or testing, but the very time of it. And I want you to keep in mind, they all died. Okay? The word ek, out of, would infer that he's, he's going to, you know, well, what is he going to do? Is he going to resurrect them and then put them, put them in it so that they can then take them back, take them out of it. They were delivered from it because, why? They died. I'm going to be delivered from it. You're going to be delivered from it because we're going to die, or, or, we're going to be raptured. One or the other. And 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 folks, that's what the word imminent means. The, the Lord's coming was imminent in the lives of these people back then. Why was it imminent? Okay? Well, just think about it. Every believer, all down, every saint, all down through the ages could say that the Lord's coming was imminent in the sense that, that uh, he, would, he would meet His Lord, not sleep for uh, in his experience okay listen to me in his experience he wasn't going to sleep for 2,000 years okay or he's, he wasn't going to be in heaven as some disembodied spirit uh, waiting his new body you know to be put back in the grave to be raised at the rapture it was imminent it's always been imminent folks in the sense that that, that to be absent from the body, this body, is, is to be present with the Lord. And that's not, I don't believe for one second, that's the, you know, us in heaven you know, awaiting a new body. Or that uh, uh, there's a sense of incompleteness. We, you know, there, there's a sense of longing for something that we don't have. Think about it, folks, okay? I do not believe that to be the case. So I would I would refer you back to some of the videos I've made on time versus eternity. I believe our death is a rapture, but that is not the purpose of our study here. Uh, it's the next prophetic event. The rapture is, and you know, which you ought to be looking for. You, which you and I both ought to be looking for. Uh, I had some recent correspondence concerning uh, Matthew 24, and many Christians tend to look at that, all these signs and stuff that's given in Matthew 24 as, as that which pertains to uh, the time in which we're living. Uh, folks, that's after the rapture of the church, okay? Just read it honestly, and you'll see that that has to do with what occurs after we're gone. It is that generation which won't pass away until all these things be fulfilled. Okay? You're not of the night. We are not of the night. We're of the day. And that day will not overtake us as a thief. And God instructs us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and, and to live sensible and, to, and upright and godly in this present age. How do we do that? We can only do that 
if we're exalting Christ, if our message, our life, our ministry is exalting Christ, not self. Our blessed hope is the rapture. Our, our title, Blessed Hope Forever, it ends for us when we are taken out of this world. And many of God's elect in the tribulation period will die. So if the church went into the tribulation period, a time of God's wrath where there is no deliverance away from it. That's the word that we're looking at here in the text. Then all of those verses speaking about our blessed hope wouldn't make any sense. Well, I was hoping to at least uh, get to, to the next verse. Uh, behold, I come quickly. Uh, that's at His appointed time. That's used of that word is used of God's promptness. Uh, how but how He's ordered everything in life to happen on His perfect timetable without unnecessary delay. It's not that He's not telling Him that He there, you know, He's He's going to return in a, in, in just a period of days. There. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That's what I wanted to get to here. I know I'm running out of time, but uh, uh, that no man take thy crown. Folks, no one can take your redemption, but they can certainly take your crown. Uh, in our studies uh, through uh, Bama, the judgment seat of Christ. We know uh, we, we, we looked at hay, wood, and stubble, uh, gold, silver, precious stone. Uh, the work is singular. Um, it's how we built on Christ. And we're to hold fast that which we have, that no man take thy crown. We're going to pick up there in, our ne in my next video. I want to take a moment to thank you all so much again for all of your kind and words of encouragement and support. Uh, I, I really do cherish all the comments that you leave. Uh, I want you to know I'm feeling uh, somewhat better. I'm, uh, I think I'm going to make it through this. I've uh, been uh, wearing a neck brace off and on. I uh, just can't bring myself to wear it all the time. I'm praying for you all constantly. So until next time, this is Steve. Rest in Him, and thanks for watching.